listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Tricia Gardner. Welcome to the show. So, uh, Tricia, what have you got for us this week? Hey, I just wanted to take a couple minutes and talk about something that I use with my clients all the time, but I don't think I've really brought it up too much on the show. And that's something called implementation intentions. And it's kind of a fancy term, but it's a very specific technique that you can use whenever you kind of set a goal for yourself or you know how you set a New Year's resolution, but then about like 90% of people or maybe it's even more don't achieve whatever their New Year's resolution or their goal is. So that's this idea, implementation intention. The guy who came up with it and has really done a lot of research on it is a guy named Dr. Peter Golitzer. And basically what he has found from a ton of research is that if you want to successfully achieve goals, you have to get the problems out of the way of getting started and persisting on it until the goal is reached. And a primary way to do that is this implementation intention, which is basically a rule you set for yourself. So you kind of think about, okay, what are the problems I have getting started or sticking to this plan? And then you make up little rules. So if X then I'll do Y. So if X happens, then I'll do Y. So, you know, you can make them around anything. uh, And you can also change it just a little bit. When this happens, then I will do whatever. And so by making up your plan in advance, then you know, whenever you get in front of one of these obstacles, you just enact your implementation and detention. Exactly. You just follow the plan. And now this seems like really simple. But like I said, Dr. Goldwitzer has done a ton of research behind it. And all the research clearly indicates that having these implementation intentions will get you a lot further and more successful with achieving goals and resolutions than if you just don't make these plans. So I think it's a really cool, you know, sensible little thing that people can do. Yes, it's a very easy tool to utilize as well, isn't it? Yes. So excellent stuff. Well, we've got Fedor coming on the show today. Um, uh, You guys might remember he was on a few months ago. And he was on a final table of the Alpha 8. Uh, He ended up winning that final table and then um, went to the Philippines and he won there as well. Another high roller for about three and a half million. So he's he's had quite the time since (laughs) since we spoke (laughs) to him last. Um, So let's give Fedor a call. So Fedor, thanks for coming back onto the show. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. And um, since, obviously, the last show, you've had quite a bit of success. Um, Last time we spoke, you were just about to head to the final table of the Alpha 8, a uh, a tournament you ended up winning for over a million dollars. So if you could talk us through that experience, because I think, was that your first live win, high roller win? Yeah, definitely. I mean, at that time, it already feels like a long time ago because I've been traveling a lot in between, but... um, that was, yeah, in Vegas, like end of the year last year, I had like a, a little bit of a rough stretch before that. And um, yeah, I was really motivated playing high rollers and I don't know, it was just super exciting. Like winning 100K is just, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a decent feeling. <laughs> now you, before you went to the final table, you had a monster stack, as I recall, in that event. Does going into the final table and just having such a huge chip lead take some of the pressure off? Or do you feel like it adds a little pressure because people are expecting you to win? Um, In that scenario, it definitely took off some pressure because, um, like, you know, that even if you get it all in pre-flop, like, you still have a lot of chips left. So it's more like in those scenarios where you're deep and maybe, like, close chip lead or something where uh, you can pretty much still bust any second. And um, when you did actually have that final hand, you've won the tournament. How did that feel? Oof, I mean, yeah, it was very, it was not the same feeling as like the W Coupe win, for example, but it was still very overwhelming. Like, I think it depends a lot on who's there too. Like, I was pretty much alone in Vegas, especially because it was quite late and no one else was playing the tournament. So I think when you're together, like, let's say an EPT main and everyone is railing you or like a WSOP or something, that also, like that adds a little more emotion to the whole thing. So does that mean you don't have a huge, like, baller party after the win story to share with us? <laughs> um, we, did, we did some partying. Like, I right. visited some friends and we went to, like, a really nice jazz party. That was, that was pretty cool. 
And then um, a few weeks after that, uh, you headed over to the Philippines. And then you won the Super High Roller there as well. So uh, did you feel that there was sort of a confidence going into that because of your win you'd just had? Did that make a big difference with your mindset heading in? Or was it just it still felt the same? Oh, for sure. My mindset, like especially the whole year I set this goal of like grinding a lot and making X amount of money. In that case, it was a million. And um, it just like... Did, I, I grinded a ton. Like I literally put like most of my time um, towards that goal. And once you reach it, and especially when like a lot of outside pressures kind of connected with that too. Like I really wanted to buy um, a house for my family, and that made it happen. So once that was off the table, like I I was just okay. Now you know now it's more about fun and enjoying the whole thing than. And uh, I don't really have a goal right now, for example. Like, I, I don't really want to win a certain amount of money or something. And, and with that, did that second win feel very different to the first one? Yeah, for sure. It was really just like the, the cherry on top. Like, even if I finished fourth there, like, there wouldn't be any, I don't know. There were, I wasn't really sweating it that much, actually. It was just super, super nice. You're super happy. But it's more like... Um, you feel like, I don't know, it's just overwhelming. Like you don't really It was realize. Just, a, just a bonus three and a half million. Wasn't exactly. It? Something like, yeah. it's just, a, just another three and a half million. What's that? What's that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously I didn't have uh, all the action. Like no, that, of course. But, but it's still, it was just, uh, it was great, great feeling. And I'm really happy that, that that happened. Now you have another super high roller event coming up uh, in May. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm flying to Monte Carlo in um Actually, it's April. Like it's, I'm flying to Monte Carlo on Tuesday. Okay. And I think the tournament is going to be on Thursday. So, yeah, I'll be ready. <laughs> You'll be ready for that. And then for people who may not know this, you are going to be doing some sort of seminar to help people improve their poker game, yes? Yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, the biggest news for me in this month. Or like what I, I just had this idea last month and I thought yeah sure a lot of people ask me for coaching and I can't really like I have to turn down pretty much everyone I maybe did like four or five private coachings the last couple of months so um, there's not much time space to do that and then I figured sure like for all of those who ask me why not do like kind of a webinar seminar kind of thing where I can tell them everything about how I reach the high stakes online and that's what i set up so for people who are listening who are thinking oh my god i can get an opportunity to actually learn from fedor how do they go about learning how to sign up for this so how it's going to work is uh you can visit my homepage, which i'm going to post on my twitter which is at grown up guy or you will, you will pretty much find it out there. We'll have a link on this on this radio yeah. podcast as well. So there'll be one on the sh- on the show page. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um. So what I'm doing right now is uh, I'm working together with a with a graphic designer team, and um, they're setting up a homepage where you can find all the information. You can also sign up. Right now, I'm capping the seminar at 50 people, and you will have to put down a little deposit so I can I can see how many people I'm. I'm uh, working with and I'm going to rent a room here in Vienna like with a camera team so it's going to be a high definition and uh, you will also see me in person presenting all the stuff which I think adds a little personality factor to it and um, yeah that's that's about it right now. And, and from that side of things um, you know what is it that people are going to be learning in that seminar? Pretty much everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> everything in poker. Like my idea for this webinar is to not hold anything back. I really just want to like, I'm not playing that much online anymore. Like not being on the grind. I will just play the, the tournaments and cash games that have like really high EV for me. So I feel like there's n- I don't lose much by giving up my, my secrets kind of to other people. And I just really enjoy coaching. And I just enjoy coaching when it's about 100%. I don't really like coaching people or things that where I'm thinking, oh, what can I tell him? What can't I talk about? So literally it will be about my preflop solutions, like 
with graphs and charts so you can you have it when you play and stuff. It's going to be on 7th of May. That's probably pretty important. 7th of May in the evening. And um, so that's the day before scoop. So we'll have like a scoop, scoop warm up kind of where you can um, get in the zone. Like Elliot will be talking about the psychological part behind it, how to be prepared in the best way on your grind routine. I will be talking about like a GTO solution to pretty much all scenarios you will be in that come up a lot, like preflop, and especially in the small blind, how to defend your big blind and stuff. Then I work together with one of the best cash game players out there right now. His name is Goosecore. Um, probably a lot of players know, know him. He's playing like 100, 200 on stars up to. And um, with him together, I'm setting up like post-flop uh, solutions. So we try to like summarize our thought process behind what sizing do we choose? How do we exploit certain ranges? And how do we play our range against certain sizings and so on? And that's pretty much the summarization of this, this whole thing. So you guys get to listen to me as well. So, you know, that's the, the, the big thing there. <laughs> the only hazard of that is that Elliot has the most hypnotic voice. Oh, what well, you're worried everyone's going to fall asleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be too well, relaxing. <laughs> yes, if you well, if you are under any stress, listening to Elliot will definitely just make you think of mountains and streams and <laughs> relax you. <laughs> so, yeah, Federer, so. <laughs> this uh, this sounds like an amazing opportunity for online players. But do you think for someone who plays primarily live that this would be something that they should attend as well? Oh, I think even for live players, and especially for live players, this is way more important. Mm-hmm. Like, poker is poker. It doesn't matter whether you play it live or online. All those guys that are playing, like the Super Howlers right now, they started out playing online. They still do, most of them. Like, it's, that's where you learn the craft, kind of. And, like, those people who say, oh, life is just about, you know, reading your opponent and stuff, they're mostly not really good poker players. And not that good life either. So I would say um, you have to have the fundamentals, the basics. And I think we offer way more than the basics. And if you, if you incorporate that into your game, I think you have, in whatever life setup, you have a very consistently higher win rate. And is, is that one of those situations where this is sort of more mid to high stakes players? who? who you oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't... I wouldn't suggest this to anyone who's playing like super low stakes. I think you can take, it's literally, it's a, an idea. It's a lot about thought processes and not really about like mathematics and stuff. It's really like how to think. We're trying to build the basis and kind of unlearn some things and then make you relearn certain things. Like unlearn your, your thinking in like, okay, I always have to do this, always have to do this, always have to do this. And try to learn you the idea of, okay, um, this is this situation. What does it remind me of? How can I apply certain, certain ideas that I've learned in that webinar? And then always try to be like open-minded towards poker spots, because that's what it's about, that you always try to think, like think what bet sizing you want to choose, think what range you want to have and so on. And I think that's a huge difference between like low mid stakes players and like successful high stakes players that they just think more actively in a lot of situations. So, yeah. I I was going to say, it's something that certainly I hear a lot when I'm speaking to the high stakes players and they're talking about a hand, you know, I rarely hear, oh, just, it was just standard. Yeah. But when I'm talking to guys in the mid stake, I hear that quite a lot where, you know, oh, it was a standard fold. And then, you know, a similar hand with a high stakes player, the, the thought process is very, very different there. It's more the, the openness, like being open towards different approaches because there's so many different points. Like that's how you get to the top is when you always question the, the way you look at poker right now because I can assure you that you will look at it in a different way in one year. So why not speed that up and like already have that certain view on it in four months by just being more critical and thinking more in depth about certain situations and never be like, Oh, this doesn't make sense. Or this is standard, like these kind of things. Nobody who's really successful says that. 
you know, it's very interesting because in peak performance psychology, there's a a term or an idea called psychological flexibility. And if you want to be, you know, health, psychologically healthier and more at ease and, and whatever, you need this psychological flexibility. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about here is being able to look at a poker problem from all these different angles. And it sounds like your seminar is going to kind of help people do that better. So I guess it's poker flexibility you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. I think everyone who's playing, who wants to play poker um, more successful should participate. Like, don't spend your whole bankroll on it. But if you're playing a certain level, like maybe, maybe not for players who play NL5, but most definitely for anyone who's playing like NL50 or uh, comparable tournaments, like everyone above like average buying of $20, it's already useful for. Like it's mm-hmm. fixing all these very obvious, uh, repet- like repetitive leaks every mid stakes player has like whenever I do a one-on-one coaching the first one to three hours I just spend on going over very simple things that I'm literally uh, just pointing out in in these four hours of the seminar already and uh, is it something um, as well that you enjoy that when you have coached someone to seeing the success that they have after the sessions I mean I know for me personally it's, it's my favorite part of the job is seeing the success in a client is that something you felt over the years Oh, for sure. It's this giving part is probably the thing that um, that pleases me the most. It's just the idea kind of making someone better than myself, like giving him like seeing how they teach me sometimes more than I teach them by just the way they look at it or like how they how they incorporated into their own game or how they reflect it and like all these things that are really interesting to me. You know, you mentioned fixing obvious repetitive leaks. Is there just maybe one leak that you can share with our listeners that is very obvious to you that a lot of people have that maybe it hasn't, you know, clicked with our listeners? (laughs) I would say the thing that literally everyone does all the time and most of them know about it too and like just sometimes don't care is definitely opening too wide there i would say nowadays there are very very little there's a very small group of people who opens too tight Hmm. um so it's just just this very simple thing of like you literally have a chart and you just have to raise a certain amount of hands and everyone fails just because it requires discipline. And yeah, that's number one. When you never sit down and never create that chart and never have like a guideline, you just follow your emotions kind of, and that will lead you into situations where whenever your emotions are not on top, then you will make mistakes. Yeah, and it's something that, you know, a lot of the time people are desperately trying to justify opening wider you know, after the session, you know, it's like, oh, but that player was like this, you know, that, that allowed me to do it. Um, and I think being honest with yourself, if you're out there, you know, have a look at the way you've been playing and what you believe you should be opening and be honest if you're actually doing that. And I think that's something the sort of the, the honesty about your own game is incredibly important for poker players. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like too, if if you are just sort of opening, you know, willy nilly like this, then you're going to get into some issues around balance. And I'm sure better you could talk a lot more, you know, about <laughs> that. But uh, but that's something maybe people are not thinking about when they are, you know, opening too wide. For sure. I mean, it's it's literally most of, most of about discipline. Just mm-hmm. having, I, I wouldn't say I'm an extremely disciplined person compared to like in society, how what people call discipline, but in the, in the poker world, I would say I'm probably one of the most disciplined players. I just re- rarely gamble. I don't take too many big risks in situations where I shouldn't. But that's like that should be normal, I think. And I'm I'm always really surprised how how outstanding that is, where it actually isn't. It, it keeps me and Trisha in work, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we have you. Yeah, exactly. 
Now, what about the World Series of Poker? It's coming up and a lot of our listeners Mm -hmm. are very excited about the World Series. Are you excited about the World Series? I'm excited. All right. What are you most looking forward to? Um, I'm really looking forward to like losing 500k in the 300k on the first day and then just trying to (laughs) trying to grind it out in the next six weeks like that's that's the dream no I mean I'm just I'm just excited because there everyone is there you you it's never boring and it's just the one and a half months of the year where I probably make like a third of my EV of the year or something so it's just I always I always like to think of it as kind of like a how do you say a camp with all your school friends where you just go and just grind. And I really am somehow I really enjoy the grind. Like not as much as I did in the past, but still enjoying it a lot. Just the the day twos and stuff. I'm always like very very excited to play poker. And do you do you play the other games as well, or do you just stick to no limit? Uh, I will for sure play some. I will um, probably late wreck the ones that are that are not an expert in, but I will definitely play as much as I can. So I'll try to try to win a bracelet. How do you manage that um, in terms of do you take a day off here and there, or do you just like play through the whole series? What's that like for you? No days off. I'm no not days a days off. off kind of guy. You're a beast. <laughs> <laughs> We, no, we, I, we might be talking about that for that. <laughs> I, um, I like to lay dredge. That's my kind of my day off. Like when I will, I mean, there will be days where I'm busting early. So if I don't feel like uh, playing a mixed game, I just don't play the mixed game. And I just have an evening where I can go out, go eat, have some dinner with friends. And then next day I'm fresh again. I'll try to, I mean, I have... Fortunately, we have this, um, like a, a girlfriend of like, actually one of my, yeah, one of my good friends, she's, um, she's making dinner for us and brings it to the Rio, which is just out. Like the dinner is pretty much one star quality. She's such a good cook and that keeps me going. And also I'll probably hire like a personal trainer or something. So I'll be, I'll be busy doing some stuff and there are always, there are always people around to, you know, do some, some fun things. And, um, you know, with the health and things like that, do you take that very seriously over the World Series? Is that a big part of your routine there? Mm, I would say so. It's just automatically. I try to prepare it in, in like prior to the series because once you're there, you don't really focus on it that much. But as I said, like with the with the workout and the food, I think I'm on a pretty good. And also like I'm staying in the Vidara. I love this place. It's without a casino. It's just you have a nice view. The apartment looks like an apartment I would live in. So I feel very at home there. I think people, and maybe especially if it's their first time at the World Series, they underestimate how much stamina that the World Series takes if you're you know, playing a lot of events and you really need to get your diet and exercise and all that like in place ahead of time and don't try and you know just cut it, eating terrible food and, and rest and all that. And it sounds like you know, that's very much your experience as well. I think there are two things that matter, or like three things. So energy income, which is like exercise and food and social socializing that like are my three main energy incomes. Then managing energy outcome, which is especially while playing. I, c- I see a lot of players that are sitting in a 1K or 2K and they focus like a lot. They just look, try to look at every hand and like whatever it is, my personal approach to it, I'm trying to up my energy outcome, the more it means like the higher the tournament and the deeper the tournament, the more I'm focused. Like that doesn't mean I'm not focused in like the early stages, but I give myself some space. Like if I feel like listening to music, I do it because I know that it's a six week time span and I can't be too hard on myself. And I know that there will be phases where I'm just playing, like maybe just not my A game. And that happens. And you just have to know that it happens and you don't have to beat yourself up that much. And that works really well for me. Like I see it and it's always been surprising me the last two years I've been playing live pretty much, I don't know, like 200 days a year or something. It's just that people, they sit in a 1K 
and then they just punt it off. Like that pretty much never happens to me. And I think that's a huge, huge advantage when um, these blow ups don't happen to you because like maybe I'm playing at 90% and like the early stages and then I try to give 100% whenever it's somehow deep. And um, that's my second point. And then good that I remember the third one. (laughs) So we've got energy income and then we've got managing the output of your energy. Yeah. And, uh, and then there's the some third mystery third. Um, the mystery third one that I can't talk about. I'm you sorry. have to wait until you get to the seminar for. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> oh, it, it's interesting you mentioned the, um, the the focusing and managing your energy throughout the day. It's something that has come up with um, other players before, saying that they'll notice a lot of players after dinner break sort of come back exhausted. And they're not really prepared to play. So they've exhausted themselves. They've overeaten in the break. And then that's when they're turning on the pressure to take advantage of basically the the mistake those other players have made. I really, I don't know, I just blacked out. I don't remember what I wanted to say. But um, (laughs) it was two points anyway. And then I thought of something very important. But I don't know. Just in general, people, they, they don't listen. Oh, yeah, that's the third one. Yes, now I got it. Always be in touch with yourself. Like, listen to your body and listen to yourself. There is no, you can't just set a, a schedule like one day prior to or like a week or a month before WSAP and then be like, okay, that's how I'm going to do it. Like, maybe most of the guys, they've done WSAP like two, three times or maybe four, maybe five times. And it's, it's different every year because it's, it's different players. It's a different schedule. You're in a different situation of your life. You have to listen to what your body is telling you when your body is telling you like uh, it's enough stop uh, like you can you know you can you can participate like you can play on a high level right now then you should listen to that and i see that a lot too like people they're in three weeks and they just can't play anymore but they've been playing all the tournaments a year ago so they feel like they're obliged to do it this year again and they just play terrible for the next few weeks and just punt off, you know. I mean, I um, genuinely believe that taking some break days during the World Series can give you much more EV if you're exhausted yeah. than playing those tournaments for the EV. If you need it. If you need the rest, you have to be taking that rest. There's no point sure. in sitting in a tournament absolutely burnt out and exhausted. I mean, we've mentioned it before. By the end of the series, there will be lots of zombies walking around. And they'll be putting a lot of money in tournaments still just because they're absolutely burnt out and they feel obliged because they haven't yet won the brace that they told themselves was, you know, going to come a week into the series. Somehow I'm really good at like pushing the point of exhaustion back while I'm home. <laughs> like every time, every time it's, it's, you laugh, but it's really a, Every time I come home from a trip where I can already feel okay, like it's, it's enough, like I have to go home. The moment I arrive home, I just crash. Like, <laughs> I do nothing for like a couple of days and then I slowly, and then after seven days or something, come back the to next life. thing I say is like, okay, where do I fly now? What do I do now? <laughs> and, yeah, that was exactly like this last year. I, I just crashed for like 10 days after Vegas, like went to the sea, enjoyed time with my friends, visited my family. And then afterwards I just went on a six month trip again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, are you pretty um, pretty strict on things like the alcohol whilst you're, you're uh, there with the series? I don't really like partying in Vegas, so it's not that hard. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something else people need to be aware of. If you are going to play a lot, don't be treating it as a Vegas chaos holiday trip as well. Um, you know, treat it as a business trip. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, that's, but that's in life in general. That's pretty hard for people who don't treat their poker life professionally to like just turn it on in Vegas like yeah I think you have it or you don't and you should start with your life in general if you don't I'm not outstandingly good at organizing my life I'm not saying that but I was terrible like three four years ago and now I'm better at it and I'm getting better every month so well too you're in a spot now where you can hire people to help you organize your life I would imagine which can be pretty helpful. It doesn't necessarily need to pay someone. You can Mm -hmm. just giving something in return also is fine. Mm -hmm. There are people who help you if you can help them in a way. So I feel like there's always someone who's 
able to help you in a certain area, whether it's your family or if it's your friends or if it's an acquaintance or someone else. Like there's always something to trade. It doesn't necessarily have to be money. I think the big thing is to get over that idea that you shouldn't ask for help, right? Oh, yeah. It's like if you need help with something, like you said, maybe you can trade it out. You know, you're good at something, they're good at a different something or whatever. But you have to get over that attitude that, you know, I have to do everything myself. I don't even like asking for help. Yes. But like just make people help you, you know, in a good way, in a positive way. Like if you help someone, he will help you. If you talk to someone, he might even just help you in a way by just talking to you back, you know, just. Things, things like that that just happen. You just have to embrace all these moments, like try to learn out of every moment, or like every everyone you meet. They can always teach you something, even if it's just teaching you what not to do. I, I always like to think in that, in that way. Like there are so many people who taught me so much, and even if it's just what I don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you do not want to punt off in these 1K. <laughs> For example, yeah, I, I would, the way I, I saw them and how I thought about them, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to think about me. So, um, I just want to, you know, I just want to do the things that I can justify in front of myself. And, um, that's what matters. And yeah, this whole learning what not to do is also just someone who's like really happy with his life and what he's doing and just realizing that that's not for me. Like, I don't want to work a normal job like five to nine it's just not for me but i can just learn from him to pursue the thing that you love and and go for the things that you enjoy doing that's that's what i learned from these people we're going deep here today where we were like giving everybody the secret to happiness the secret to a happy life this is awesome <laughs> and the secret to mtts yeah <laughs> definitely in terms of uh, sort of that experience of of winning these big tournaments recently, did that sort of reframe everything because those goals were hit? Yeah, it definitely it definitely took me out of I was in a in a tunnel. Like I really just focused on one thing. I restructured a lot of things in my life too. After that, it's just uh, for example, I was pretty involved in the staking business. And it just like, it took away all my, most of my urge to make money. Like that's, that's pretty tough as a poker player at some point. You don't really, you're just going for the fun of it. And then, then you're not really a professional poker player in my opinion anymore. So it, it became a little more of a hobby and just all these things like find the best EV spots and travel to all these, these spots and like play that it's more it's more an automatism for me. It's what I've been doing like the last three and a half, four years. And um, so, yeah, I, I definitely see myself restructuring a lot of things in my life. I backed out out of staking. I just want to build something that has more impact, more positive impact on people and is more, um, more a long-term thing than poker is. And did it give you the sort of... Um the confidence in then doing this seminar and giving away all of this information. Yeah. You know, having, you know, you're up, I guess like five and a half million since we last spoke. Did that change things from that side? So you're now comfortable, you know, sharing these secrets. Yeah, definitely. You a little, you become a little more, I became a little more selfless. You know, what's interesting is I was just thinking since the last time we had you on, you've, your earn has been like over a million dollars a month. So <laughs> that's not bad. <laughs> Well, we said, didn't we? You know, come on the show. Everyone always wins afterwards. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. We have a very strong record of that. So going into Monte Carlo, you know, the heat is on now. <laughs> I mean, I expect big, <laughs> yeah. big time expectations over here. Hey, um, well, you came back. You know, it happens. So, um, and then um, with the seminar uh, again, what we'll do is we'll put a link on this page, and um, with the Twitter, wh- where what's your Twitter account? Uh, it's at Crown Up Guy. So just my poker star's name, at Crown Up Guy. Yeah. Excellent. And you said it was in the evening. Which time zone? Oh yeah, um, it's going to be evening for Europeans and like morning, noonish for Americans. Okay. Perfect. 
So um, everyone, obviously, come to the seminar, listen to um, Fed will teach you how to play MTTs much, much better. And then I'm going to be doing some work on the mindset things to set everyone up for scoop. Um, and any other bits that you'd like to, to explain to people on that seminar, Fed? Um, I think the short version is just I'm going to show you everything I know, give out my, my HUD, everything I know, pre-flop, post-flop, try to put it in four hours and... Um, yeah, don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And um, thank you so much um, for coming back and talking to us again. And congratulations, as I say, since last time. Um, it's really been quite phenomenal. So, you know, oh. well done from that side. You know, what a year. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem at all. And um, yeah, I'll, I shall see you there on, uh, on May the 7th. Okay, looking forward. Okay, thanks, man. Bye. Bye. As always, great to have Federer on the show. He's, he's always happy to share so much information, isn't he? Yeah, and you know, it's really interesting. I thought how much he sort of shifted with his mindset since the last time, you know, we talked to him. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been such a, you know, such a shift, you know, such huge wins, really, isn't it? You know, we're talking around five and a half million dollars of wins since our last show with him. So it's, it's just been an incredible run. Yeah, and it's interesting, I think, because as he's won that money, then he's gotten to be in a position where he can think about, okay, what do I really want to do? And, you know, contributing to others and helping others out, it seems like you know, it's pretty high on his list of priorities. Yeah, it's always more fun, isn't it? Seeing other people succeed. I'm sure once you've reached there, it, it must be fun to bring other people up. Yeah. You know what I thought was super interesting about uh, the whole deal? I just, as he was talking, I wrote down like a little note to myself, which is you've got to have a pro attitude. And everything he talked about, it just made me think like, you know, this is how a pro thinks versus, you know, maybe some amateur type thinking. So like, try and learn everything in every moment and, you know, really managing your energy and just like all the things he was talking about. I was like, you know what, this is what a pro does. And the discipline. Yeah. The, the fact that you think, you know, people are punting off, you know, it, it makes such a big difference if you can maintain that discipline throughout the tournaments. Yeah. So it's kind of like, do you want to be a pro or do you want to be an amateur? And if you want to be a pro, you're going to have to do like these hard things because we all know that like self-discipline can be really hard, right? Unless you work with one of us, Trisha. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so if you're out there and you want to make it to the top <laughs> so yeah guys check out um federal seminar as i said we'll put a link in the page here um, and you can watch that on may the 7th and trisha you've also got a webinar coming up uh, if you'd like to ex explain where people can find that yeah i do have a webinar coming up on saturday and people can go to the site holdembook.com forward slash Cardner forward slash live. And basically, uh, this is coming from Jonathan Little's book, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em, which I did a chapter in. And so we're all kind of doing these webinars teaching people. But I'm going to be teaching people about creating an unbeatable mindset and how they can master their psychology. So check that out, hold'embook.com forward slash Cardner forward slash live. And we'll put a link to that on the page as well. So it's, it's easier for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I'm actually releasing a video series soon on improving your volume at the table, which has videos, it has homework, coursework, things like that. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that as well. And that's at pokermindcoach.com. Um, so yeah, good to have Feder on the show and uh, we shall see you soon. Bye guys. You've been listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Tricia Gardner. To get any resources mentioned in the episode or to listen to past shows, visit pokermindcoach.com forward slash TMA podcast. Thanks for listening.